20th century was the era of wars, the 21st century is on the road to diplomacy. Not to say that Henry Kissinger has not written a book by the name of Does America Need a Foreign Policy Towards Diplomacy for the 21st Century? Which leads me to ask you the question, uh, does America even have a foreign policy concerning the recent events of Afghanistan, or be it in Ukraine or, or Russia? And before we address the question, I'd like to welcome each of you all to Argumenter Podcast. I'm joined by my fellow argumenters, Minaj and Naidli. And also we are joined by Dr. Manojo Ness. He served as the Associate Professor with International Studies, Political Science and History at Christ DMTB University and has worked on several research projects such as India's neighborhood policy, um, Maldives, the armed conflict in South Asia, to, to, to name a few. And so uh, hoping to have a great session ahead with regard to the podcast and welcome to Argument of Podcast and hope you're doing well, sir. So, sir, uh, considering the, 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 the issue at hand and what we're talking about with regard to the th- th- Taliban or be it Ukraine as well, uh, there was a re- recent report what the UN uh, General Secretary, uh, Antonio Guterres, who mentioned that, you know, it has been six months since the entire situation of the ca- capture of Kabul happened. And uh, there's a lot of uncertainty ahead with regard to the same. So, uh, and also he had mentioned that, you know, the Taliban is definitely showing efforts to present itself as a caretaker government. But it's not, it's not something which is really effectively able to do so considering so many, so many violations as such. So, sir, uh, if, if a, a particular organization like the Taliban and what is trying to like right now seek is for recognition, uh, why do you think that certain countries have often been wary? Is it because of, of the past or is it because it's unable to look beyond the past and, and think ahead of with regard to legitimizing this, though it's very uh, wrong to say so because we still consider them as, as a terrorist organization. So, and also, if you could clear the anomaly behind the Taliban being a, a single unit, considering a, like it's an overlarging uh, view of the of Taliban being of a particular image, such basically, or or as other separate groups under the, under the, the Taliban as well. So, sir, over to you, sir. All right. So, so anyway, uh, uh, I really appreciate your initiatives in 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 making uh, the outside world know about throwing certain lights on issues that you feel are important. So my best wishes to you. Coming to your question about uh, world getting grappling with Taliban and are there any uh, kind of divisions among Taliban is what I, if I understand the two part question. As I'll answer the second part because this is related to the first part. Whether there are any divisions. So this we have been seeing uh, for, for, for decades, whether you can divide Taliban into good Taliban and bad Taliban or are there any factions within Taliban like moderate Taliban or extremist Taliban or radical Taliban. So if you look at any group, this kind of shades of opinion are bound to be there and Taliban is not an exception in that case. But when it comes to good or bad, let me take a neutral position because I don't want to comment on this because generally people feel that you cannot have a good or bad because fire is a fire. You cannot have a, have a fire that is, that is soothing for you and fire that burns you because fire is a fire. That's how one can always look at Taliban because the fact that each and every one in the group needs to abide by the dictates of or the, the credo of a particular organization shows that you cannot divide them into two. Here, I'm not saying Taliban is bad or good. Uh, Let me hold a neutral position. But the point is that you cannot distinguish that manner. But radical or moderate, we can always have a discussion on that because in any organization, as I said, you may have radical views where people wanted to push things very fastly and uh, very quickly to, to achieve a kind of instant results. And some in the organization wants to go slow so that they want to have a sustained kind of momentum to achieve the results. This is how, and that applies to Taliban as well. Hope hope I answered that particular question. And that applies to Taliban 2.0 also. Taliban 1.0, yes, there was a lot of unity in the sense that how Mullah Omar was keeping the flock together. Now, Taliban 2.0 is a kind of different because the lot of the younger generation, which has come about in the past two decades, since 1996, and you would see so many people coming around, like for instance, 25 years or 26 years or three decades closely, 
the, the, the generation has changed. That way you have a lot more better educated or better thinking or better exposed to outside world. Those are all the people in charge now. I'm not talking about the higher leadership, the middle level and lower leadership. So this is how the current state of act as far as the organization is concerned and their policies also is getting reflected by how the organizations organization is. So all I would say is Taliban has different shades of opinion, but which shade of opinion is dictating is that the conservative opinion as of now. This is what perhaps this point of view may help you later how the conservative opinion at the top because the leadership is thus belong to the older generation and that is the opinion that prevails pervades throughout now coming back uh, to your first question in terms of how world is grappling with taliban because this was like a sudden nobody expected this to happen all of a sudden uh, when we when we go back and see the intelligence reports of early august 2021 people were saying that maybe after two, three months, Taliban may take over or Taliban may come to power, something like that. But all of a sudden, within a week or so, they just swept on, on 15th August, 2021. They were in Kabul and um, Americans packed their packs. And this was sudden one where for next one or two weeks from August 15th, world was actually didn't know what to do, including India, Pakistan or whatever, perhaps Pakistan, uh, perhaps was expecting, but still even they surprised Pakistan and they surprised everybody. So now only things are unfolding how to actually handle Taliban. Because it's not just Taliban, it is Afghanistan. So Afghanistan is not Taliban. Afghanistan is the people, as I always uh, tell you, state consists of these five elements. One is the territory, you have Afghan territory. Then you have the population where it's not just Taliban that consists of population. There are only a few thousands of Taliban, but it's the population, the people of Taliban, which are millions in millions. Then you have what is known as government. Earlier, there was not Taliban government. Now you have Taliban government. And then you have sovereignty, of course, by sheer will of their power, as Mao said, power flows from barrel of gun. They are holding power because of their whatever the sheer arms that they have, arms power. And then the international recognition, this is where three countries, perhaps you can say few countries, not just three, few countries. You name China, Russia, Pakistan, and certain West Asian countries, they have recognized Taliban, but still international recognition is also not forthcoming. So when you look at all these five elements, all are in a state of flex. This is what is happening. So nothing is certain now. Even population is moving out. Nothing is coming. So there is ingress and egress that you have to see in terms of population. Egress is more than ingress. Although Taliban is calling people to come back because they didn't, didn't want to lose out. But egress is more in terms of people just fleeing by not just legitimate manner, but just, they are just fleeing to Pakistan, to India, all kinds of places. They are just fleeing. And government is still, right, getting ready as far as Taliban is concerned, right? And then territory, of course, they have issue with Pakistan and then it's still okay. Still the northern parts of Afghanistan is still not that firmly under control to Taliban. This also we should keep in mind. And of course, sovereignty, it depends on how sovereignty has two, two parts here. Internally, you have to be supreme and externally, you have to be independent. In both the cases, the sovereignty is not firmly in control. And as I said, the fifth element, international recognition, it's not coming. So we need to look at all these issues from these five elements, how Taliban is handling these five elements. All right. So the international community is yet to actually look at these five elements in a firm manner. Once that gets firmed up, then only we can talk about other, other things. So uh, do correct me if I'm wrong, sir, but as per the Geneva Conventions, would it be correct to recognize Taliban as the government because it, it, it lays down particularly that whenever there is some military uh, coup that takes over the country with, by force, other nations are forbidden from recognizing such, uh, you know, such reigns. 
So that is something that Russia and China ha has done because they haven't wit withdrawn uh, any of their diplomats or the em embassies from Afghanistan currently, and Pakistan is willing to initiate talks with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so generally, if you look at Leave Taliban, generally we look around. There are a lot of governments. This there is always this this movement is always there. So any legitimate government is getting thrown out usually by military. Sometime back, what happened in Myanmar, or uh, or what happened in Sudan, or what happened in 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 uh, uh, Burkina Faso, somewhere it happened. Who has happened? So who even Pakistan it happened. There is a politics to it or international politics to it. So whether the international community, uh, by and large. Uh, commanded or or controlled by a particular state, maybe perhaps United States or the West, if they wanted a particular government to be recognized, yes, it, it goes recognized. Otherwise, a particular government doesn't like it. It is not. So there is an international politics to it, irrespective of whatever the conventions say. This is one aspect. Now, coming back to Taliban, this is what, in terms of they came to they came to power through sheer force. Whether to recognize or not, it depends on how the countries or the international community sees it. That's why they see whether, in the interest of the population, whether the Taliban is getting a moderate kind of version of itself compared to the 1996-2001. If that is the case, most of the countries, or at least 50% of the countries, they don't mind recognizing. Maybe perhaps even but India. Indian. Comparing it to the past history, so when their rule persisted from 1995 to uh, 2001, it was one of the most darkest ages in Afghanistan where it became a base for most of the terrorist groups in the country, which led to 9 mm. 11 attacks. And right now, the peace treaty between US and Taliban just stands on one promise. It's just a promise given by Taliban that, okay, we will abstain from force. So, do you think that this will actually be something binding on them? So on, do, on do, do, don't, don't you think there's some necessary precautions that US should have taken before leaving the, before leaving Afghanistan in such a situation? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, if 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 I need to answer that specific question about precaution, that's what as I as I already indicated, nobody expected Taliban to sweep in that 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 rapid manner. That's why the intelligence failed or whatever precautionary measures because who should have sounded out it's the it was the intelligence community that should have sounded out which utterly failed and whatever the military perspective planning people they did not have any plan b in place suppose if taliban would come to power just immediately what would be the what would be the the evacuation plan or exit strategy they did not have that's why it took some time for them to exit but the point here is, you are right. Let me connect to the treaty. So the previous Trump administration was working on treaty for quite some time. When they signed the treaty, it should have they should have expected then that point in time. But if you read the treaty very very carefully, two points that comes out very clearly. One is they did not recognize Taliban as a state actor. They always, if you read treaty carefully, they always clearly pointed out Taliban is one of these kinds of organization, non-state actor kind of thing. Second is, in terms of, they, they clearly laid out that or they binded hands of Taliban or they put a lot of riders for US exit. So that riders, of course, Taliban was not abid abiding by all the riders except to let US go unharmed. Other than that, I don't think Taliban has actually abided by the agreement, whatever they signed. But what can you do about it? You cannot do anything about it. And US did not do anything about it except to freeze the assets, not within Afghanistan, but somewhere hold up here and there. That's it. So it wouldn't be impossible for them to access assets because as you know, Afghanistan is a exporter of opium and that is how they've been they have they have so much you know access to assets and you know financial gain so there is no promise in future if afghanistan does indeed turn into uh you know the uh, like the ground of where you know there is there is there's a lot of breeding of terrorist groups and in and it is very uh, uh 
should i say tragic that they failed to recognize this as a state actor because us was the one which founded and trained initially the mujahideen group which came to be which came to be known as taliban under the uh, uh, mohammad omar's uh, mulla omar's uh, leadership okay let me factually i think we need to get it right it was not us that created taliban so when you just go back to to i said in 70s Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Ah, Joel, go ahead. Uh, so, but it was with the help of the ISI, which which was able to like backstab into making the Mujahideen. Yeah, yeah. I'll just quickly take a minute to tell that yes, particular yeah. backdrop. Perhaps audience may may wish to know, or they also know. So, late seventies, Soviet Union was in Afghanistan. So that time it was peak of Cold War, where United States did not want. the so called domino theory to go into action because domino theory was all about if one country fall to communism successfully most of the countries may fall us did not want and that's why precisely they thought that if afghanistan falls pakistan would then india would and then bangladesh it will go on like this anti asia would be would be swept by communism already china was there so us was a bit jittery and scary about this so it did not want so all it did was to prop up some kind of organization or some kind of asymmetrical warfare against soviet union because us did not want to involve itself something like vietnam it did not want at the same time they wanted soviet union to bleed internally by facing that kind of vietnam which united states faced so all they did was to engineered fostered non state actor in the form of mujahideens so they called what was known as uh, i would call it as uh, kidamat where uh, if i translate that from arabic to english office of works of 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 uh, arab afghans this is how the organization was so abdullah azam was in charge that time osama was not there in picture at all there was somebody called as abdullah he was the one who was basically all this organization was doing whatever arabs coming from west asian countries or from arabian kind of states to afghanistan to fight against united states they were giving good logistical support so that's why it was otherwise called as the hospitality kind of services that they were providing later on it transformed when ayman al dawhiri and osama bin laden came to the picture right and then they called what was known as al qaeda al qaeda means the base al the qaeda means base which means it is base of so many people so many organizations which can operate it's like a franchise you have dominos pizza hats things like that it was like a franchise even today it is a franchise right so this is how al qaeda started and us saudi arabia kuwait united arab emirates and so many countries they started actually the funding and giving arms and training whatever to the al qaeda this is how it started but once soviet withdrew post 1989 and you know afghanistan was one of the kind of achilles heel for soviet union to fall and soviet union fell and by 1990 1991 afghanistan came under taliban this is how you need to see when soviet union was there lot of people fled all over the world something like what happened now and most of these fled to pakistan and at one point pakistan was having a record of hosting largest number of refugees in the world and they were in the camps especially the the north and northwest province right and in that camps whatever children that were born they were actually provided education in local madrasas and that students that's why talib means student taliban means this the student those students who got trained they became kind of this this kind of mujahids or jihadists or militants and then from 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 early 90s onwards they were going back and wanted to get back afghanistan for themselves and 1996 they went and they captured this is how taliban came so 
US was not directly involved in getting Taliban, but indirectly, you can say so, because of the influx of refugees or the outflux of refugees to Pakistan. And in that camps, whatever these students, they became Taliban and they went. So during that Taliban time, yes, initially, Taliban was not supporting. But later on, when, when, when Osama bin Laden turned against United States, Saudi Arabia, and all those people, their former masters, so he was driven out uh, from Saudi Arabia. He went to Afghanistan. From Afghanistan, when he was pressured, Taliban also listened to them and asked Osama bin Laden to go away. Then he went to Sudan. From Sudan also, he was pressured, and then he, he was back at Afghanistan. It is where that 9-11 and so many other the, the terror acts were planned. So you can see starting from 1993, World Trade Center, first bombing. First bombing. And then you have you had plethora of attacks that took place. US yeah, school, or Kenya or Tanzania, or then you can say Kober uh, Towers attack in Saudi Arabia, and then you can have you had uh, in Indonesia or Philippines, plethora of attacks all over the world that took place all planned and engineered from Afghanistan. So now US started attacking Taliban and of course World Trade Center happened. But here to be fair to Taliban, Taliban was not in favor, especially Mullah Omar was not in favor of 9-11 attack. But, Tal but Osama bin Laden was firm about it and he was also convinced by mid-level Al-Qaeda operatives saying that this is very important. Otherwise, you cannot keep the flock together. You need to keep on doing these attacks. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense according to them. So that is how 9-11 happened. And when you look at the letter, uh, Osama bin Laden, I would urge you to go through this letter, open letter to America, which was published in Guardian on 24th November 2002. You can, if you Google this, you will get that particular letter. He openly writes a letter to America answering two questions. The question number one was, why did we attack you? This is question number one he answers. He gives eight point answers. And then what we want you to do, he himself gives ans answers, seven answers he, 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 he gives, right? So this letter would give, throws up a lot of, kind of insights on how Al-Qaeda's motivations to attack the West, especially in America. All right. So this is a factual thing. I wanted to just get it right. Um, so my question or inference from this whole fiasco is that, uh, do you think there needs to be a change in the attribution of conduct to states in international law? Because this is not the first time U.S. through uh, non-state actors like Taliban has gained a backdoor entry, entry into the internal affairs of another country. As you must know, there, there was another celebrated case. Uh, it's called as the U.S. Nicaragua case. There also they had funded military to, troops, uh, which led to a lot of destruction in the country. But in the end, no one could be held liable, especially U.S. couldn't be held liable, even though they funded the troops because the direct control of that particular non-state actor could not be attributed to that state. So in order to uh, not particularly to uh, um, show, uh, showcase any, any country in a bad light, but uh, just to mention that uh, we need to, you know, strict in rules so that there is no other country that meddles in the affairs of another country, which can lead to such effects through yeah, non-state actors. So do you think there's need, there needs to be a change in that? And just adding on to that, so like, is, is there also a requirement? Like, is like, do you actually see like uh, uh, coming to the first question, which I, which I started with the with the with the, with the entire session as to is there uh, really a foreign policy for for the United States, or is it as per Kissinger's words, you know, America has no permanent friends or enemies, but only interests. So uh, adding on to to the aspect of how the the backdoor entry as well, but also is it also it, it's always an interest of America and not with regard to uh, world peace and world, uh, world peace and as such. Okay. Anyway, uh, let me address neither is the larger question about the can any country in general, not just United States, any country is allowed, should it be allowed by the international conventions or uh, legal frameworks to meddle, so-called meddle. 
the assumption behind the question is that you can have international frameworks and you can enforce it. That is the assumption. So I'm not sure whether we can go as far as that assumption and approach global politics because it is not like national politics or it is not like how uh, the internal affairs of the in inside country, how it behaves, how it, it doesn't, because what happens inside the country, you can enforce it. But as far as the international arena is concerned, you cannot enforce. And as people say, at the international level, it's an anarchy. So whoever is most powerful, they usually have their way. And that is how the history of global politics has been from the basis. So this, let me, I have to put this point right in the beginning itself. So it is difficult to actually enforce anything. If it is difficult to have a consensual kind of, on this particular issues, to have any kind of agreement on whether we should go or not to go. Having said that, let's be fair to any country, it doesn't matter United States or this or that. In general, um, you look at people. So you take uh, at one point in time what happened in Rwanda, right? So there were massacres happening. And what happened uh, sometime back in uh, Kosovo or Serbia, right? So can you, or even during Taliban regime, so can we justify anything? People are getting massacred and killed and violated, can we justify that it is the internal affairs and we cannot do anything about it? Yeah, you can do that. You can do that. But how long can you do that? But here the intention is very important. If any country with good intention goes and tell or does something about that mess, that is good. But if any country uses those mess or whatever happens in other countries for its own interest that is where the problem is this is where i think you are you are having difficulty in distinguishing between these two yes us did use all those interests for its benefit at the same time we cannot generalize it also united states also helped to get countries of people out of the mess this also to be fair to united states of course, it is not just United States. Let me connect Joel's point here. It is not just United States, any country. It is true that there is no permanent friend or permanent enemy, only permanent interest matters. All countries in the United in the in the international arena, they look for their in 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 sustaining or furthering their interests, national interests. This is how we either go to war or go to diplomacy. This is how we do because these are the means of achieving our national interest. This is how every country go for. Sometimes we go for negotiations or diplomatic kind of means, otherwise we go for war. This is how, these are the two methods available. So United States by being a, the, the largest and biggest and most powerful military power, it, it, can, it can choose at will whatever it wants to do, right? So this is what has happened. That's what, let's put things in context. You had what is known as democratic peace theory, which uh, underlying point was democracies, they don't go to war and they respect liberties, human rights or whatever. So it is better that all countries in the world, if they become democracies, there won't be war and people will be peaceful. This is democratic peace theory. This perhaps from time to time, U.S. upholds this or U.S. furthers this or U.S. uses this to justify its actions. But sometimes intentions may not be very clear. Sometimes intentions may be good, right? So this is how we need to distinguish. So we may not generalize U.S. in a very bad light. At the same time, we cannot say that U.S. has doesn't have blood in its hand. We cannot say it like that also. And this applies to most of the countries. Right, But at the same time, we need to be very mindful of what is happening around us. Suppose, can we just keep quiet if people are suffering around us? Right. So there was one concept, I'm not sure you heard about this, R2P. R2P means responsibility to protect. It doesn't matter which country. Can you just keep quiet if people are suffering? End of the day. Because 
states, evolution of states came post-Westphalian, but people have been there from the beginning. So can you keep quiet? This is a question that we need to answer again and again. That comes to India also. Suppose if something happens in India, if some other countries come, we always argue that it is our internal affairs, right? But they may argue, they may put this concept of R2P, but there has to be some line because they may misunderstand whatever is happening in India, which we may be in a position to understand rightly. That's why it's very important to understand the nuances of the situations, even that be Afghanistan or, or, or Sudan or Syria, we need to understand that and then only whatever the interventions accordingly should be taken place. So now let me come to Naidali's the question about should international frameworks require amendments or should there be change or not? So we need to answer that based on this. Number one, you may have in that sense, will all agree to it? I'm not sure. Even if they agree to it, can you enforce it? I'm not sure. Even if you enforce it, what is the basis for that enforcement in terms of intentions, right? Or in terms of understanding the ground realities? Because most of the times we are ignorant of what is happening around us. That is where it's so important for us as scholars, we need to push that right kind of, uh, uh, not information, but in terms Discourse. of the right understanding of the situations, that is what I say. Yeah. So when you when you when you go with these all these points clearly, then I think the frameworks may work better, right? Because let me also say that despite we facing terrorism for ages, we don't have any internationally accepted convention on terrorism even today. India has been pushing for it. We don't have because. We don't, ask, we don't even agree on who is terrorist, who is freedom fighter, right? There is a, always this dilemma. Yeah. Always, sorry, Minaj. I, yeah, go ahead. No, sir. I, I, was just, uh, uh, I was just trying to bring the attention back to Afghanistan. So when you brought about America and its contribution and how it's sort on, so in certain cases, it sort of disrupted the peace. In certain cases, it's added on to the peace. We can't ignore America's contribution and how the uh, Taliban got... Uh, got ousted out of Afghanistan and then Afghanistan enjoyed a, a brief decade of peace, democracy and uh, betterment of human rights and uh, education and many other uh, factors like uh, boosted economy, etc. So, so since the Taliban is back into power now, can we say for sure that the past 10 years of sort of boom that Afghanistan has gained, is all of that whitewashed and is Afghanistan back to uh, the drawing board again? Can we make that assumption because the Taliban is back or can some of that progress still be retained moving forward? Okay. All right. All right. Uh, wonderful question. So my, my just straight answer is no, it's not whitewashed. Whatever they built up over a period of time, it's not whitewashed. Why? Number one, let's take uh, the very institutions they built up. They called it as democracy. They started building up. That that institutions, though it may not be uh, tangibly visible under Taliban, but in terms of the, the democratic spirit, which you can distinguish between constitution and constitutionalism, because you all know better. Constitutionalism is the spirit behind the constitution. You may throw out the constitution, you can change the constitution, doesn't matter. That ism is there. Similarly, the democratic ism that has actually pervaded for 20 years now, that is there ingrained, entire generation. They had no idea what was Taliban all about. All they know was new was this open, right? Freedom, freedom of movement, expression, all those things were, they were saying that. And you cannot take that away just like that. You cannot switch off the light just like that. No, you cannot do that. So this is number one. Second is in terms of the education sector where the whole generation, got educated through the modern education systems. So they got educated. They knew what it was. They knew the outside world, unlike the early version of 1990s of Afghan people. Now they clearly know what it is all about. So that you cannot just like that, open their brain and then use an eraser and do that. No, you cannot do that. Third is the technology. So I'm not sure whether you people were born in 1996. I'm not sure about it. I don't know your... Uh, 
whatever <laughs> birth dates, uh, assume that you were not there. That time mobile was not there. This kind of technological explosion was not there. Internet was not there. Now every Afghan witnessed what was smartphone, what was right Facebook, what was this website and all those things they know. Now getting information is not a big deal now. And even Afghan, Afghan Taliban cannot uh, shut off this internet. They cannot do that. They also need it. They also, because this is the only window towards the outside world, whatever. And they are also trying to do that. So in terms of this technological focus, how can they actually shut off just like that? They cannot do that. And then fourth element is, they are trying their best to project themselves as a good guys. All right. Though world may believe or not believe, that's why I was personally taking neutral stand. Because I hope that Taliban, whatever they say is true in the sense that we are good guys or we are reformed guys, whatever. If that is the case, they need to actually show proof of the pudding. All right. They cannot just show that we have a pudding. They need to actually show that. So in that sense, the world is watching, media is reporting. There is one instance where even Israeli media also was allowed to, to, to interview Taliban leadership. So in that sense, they are open. So in that context, they are not shutting off and uh, it's not being taken away. And then fifth one is connectivity. They are also actually enhancing the connectivity where, where uh, they want uh, flights to come, trains to move or buses or whatever roads to uh, get. This is the fifth one. Sixth one is in terms of reaching out to the world, all the countries, including India or United States, they wanted to reach out. So whatever their office in Qatar or something, it's functional. They wanted to actually reach out and because they wanted their coffers to be filled. It's not that once their coffers filled, they will go back, but coffers is always getting renewed, right? So you spend and you need money, you spend, you need money. Because as per the statistics, Afghanistan economy is now dominated by the, the primary sector and the tertiary sector. Primary is agriculture, tertiary is services. For both, you need the external interaction. Otherwise, you cannot operate. You need to trade with countries. Uh, if we go like um, the Taliban economy, 800 million is what they are exporting now. But 9 billion is what they need to run the economy, right? So you see the difference, right? 10 times there is a difference. Who will bridge it? So 30 to 40% they need the budgetary support as a result of aid. So they need the interaction with the outside world. So you cannot just let them take away everything, right? These are certain things. I'm, I, I may be missing a lot of other things. For the paucity of time, these are seven, eight parameters where you cannot just like that shut things out. And so before we come to the end of the session, so would you like to comment on how, how this whole thing affects India and how India should sort of move forward with its diplomatic relations or in fact, how it should monitor its, uh, its, its what do you say, its borders, et cetera, with, with Afghanistan? So. Especially the recent event of like adding on to in, uh, to Miyana's point, wherein India tried to send aid to Afghanistan, but it was later blocked by Pakistan as well. And so the, 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 it's not just um, uh, it's, it's not with regard to the relation with Afghanistan, but it's also the surrounding countries which impacts India's policy towards Afghanistan or, or even other countries as such. So as as someone as a professor who has who deals with international studies, how do you assess India's stand with regard to Afghanistan and also with regard to it, the surrounding nations and a diplomatic chance and also especially since you've also done a project on the, the Maldives uh, as well. So, and the recent India out campaign by, by, by the ex-president uh, ex as such. So what do you see these changes and how does India, uh, adding to my husband, how does, how, how does India react to the same as such? Okay. Neither do you have any follow-up questions or winding up question? Um, yes. Yeah, so after you answer this, I think I'll post my question. Okay. All right. All right. So the two part questions in terms of what should be India's stake in terms of Afghan per se, and what should be India's stake in terms of the, the neighbors of Afghanistan, how should we go about? So I see both are related. You cannot delineate both in a two categories of treatment. Both are so related because 
it's how the other countries deal it impacts on afghanistan to be fair to india i think we should appreciate india because india has been reaching out and seeing afghanistan as afghan people afghanistan has been traditional friend of india if not pakistan afghanistan has been and afghans warm up to india greatly in general this is how they do and afghan afghan people are always friendly with indian people they are also favorably disposed to india that's why you can see so much of warmth between even people to people relations government to government relations all i would see is governments may change but state and the people they remain forever that's how we need to actually see and have the larger picture that is how india is seeing it so irrespective of the regime we see people suffering or people's reach out this is how we are seeing afghanistan this is how we are reaching out and that's why we are actually whatever aid or 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 uh, whatever the help that or whatever assistance that we are giving considering the people in mind because there is so much of starvation so much of humanitarian crisis which we want of course now there are certain countries which want to obstruct this because they don't want india to be seen in a positive light in afghanistan so they want to obstruct it uh, but that is unfortunate but still we need to actually reach out we know how to reach out either through iran or central asian countries we know how to reach out or we should be in a position to convince pakistan that it's in the larger interest of this particular region that afghanistan gets stability otherwise what happens radicalization in any form it doesn't matter i am not saying a particular religious denomination any form of radicalization is not good because it pulls your development trajectory backwards because we are all in countries 7 8 decades only we need at this point in time a good atmosphere or peaceful atmosphere for development because this development and security goes hand in hand without security no development no development no security because this needs to be understood by all the countries if we act one against the other we are actually canceling each other this is how some of the neighboring states of india need to understand and we also have to keep on trying instead of giving up taliban today is there tomorrow it may not be there we don't know so we should not give up afghanistan or we should not let afghan people down because we have actually invested uh, around 3 billion in afghanistan there is infrastructure and things like that and that should not go waste of course i'm sure taliban would not blow those dams or uh, blow those roads up whatever india constructed i am sure about it so this is how we need to see the larger context it doesn't matter whether that be maldives or sri lanka bangladesh or myanmar it doesn't matter we should also we should always keep trying this otherwise india's development trajectory will not go forward or will not hit north if we have a kind of disturbed neighborhood because we cannot see ourselves as a as a, as an island of stability in a sea of instability we cannot do that we cannot afford one day one day we may get swayed by that sea of instability so you need to actually build the stability around your neighborhood and that is very very important i think we should keep trying about it though you may get pulled down now and then but we should keep trying patiently so yeah. um how do you think this is impacted uh, the scenario of like protection of women's rights through the entire world because in the first regime of taliban we saw it we saw women being you know uh, brutally killed you know or or being forbidden from attending schools so what do you think could be the situation now or based on your analysis how could that be impacted or do you see some winds of change in that area as well okay so this is very whatever uh, the picky issue that uh, world has been watching or looking at it's not only you the whole world is concerned about what especially happens to women because uh, we still have the trauma of how uh, women were were seen in a kind of negative or poor light or how women were treated during taliban regime 96 to 2001 but i see 
going by the reports, whatever we get, the not winds of change, but a kind of change in the way women are treated. The reasons, whatever I spelled out, how the various reasons I spelled out, how Taliban just like that did not want to uh, want to actually to take back to the ages, right? So women are women issue or gender issue is also seen in that. So a couple of things they are doing. One is that they are clearly they clearly said that women can go to schools and colleges, but in segregated classrooms. So earlier they were coed or something like that, like how you are sitting in the class. Now they say segregated. So which is fine. It's okay, right? As long as women are educated, it's fine. Second is they say that women can also work, right? This is also a postulate where earlier said that women can only be confined to indoors. Now it's also possible because when you allow for education, you should allow them also to work, right? This is also fine. All these, whether I'm not sure whether this is through change of heart, I'm not sure, but at least some kind of international pressure is working for this particular change scenario. So what we need to do now is from the international community point of view, you need to keep on sustaining the pressure and keep on using the economic leverage that you have on Afghanistan to make sure that women are taken care of. If not wonderfully, at least they are not messed up. At least we should actually continue to do international community, continue to do. I see all these things that is coming out because we need to go and see what is exactly happening. This we go by the reports, but still there are oppression acting uh, that is happening against women. They are not free as they were for the past 20 years. All these things are happening, but at least whatever that Taliban is letting women to do, still I see that as a kind of window of hope, but we need to open that window wider and wider through pressure, sustain the pressure. That's where uh, the media, um, including social media, uh, NGOs, uh, activist organizations, they have to actually go to the ground, work on that, and then let the outside world know and let the outside world to pressure on Taliban to make sure that things are fine. Um, thank you so much for coming to this session, sir, despite your busy schedule. It was a very uh, refreshing perspective because uh, looking at how the media reports, it's always on one side. So we could understand what could be two sides of a coin here. Um, so uh, thank you for everyone for tuning into the Argument of Podcast session. Uh, you can find us on IGTV and Spotify. Do tune in for more interesting content. Thank you. Thank you. I once again appreciate all of you for uh, taking this particular initiative and uh, and doing a good job, marvelous job. All right. Thank you. All the best. You always have my support. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. This current episode, the full length, will be available on YouTube, and also you will be able to find the latest updates about the session as well on Instagram and other platforms as well. So do like, share, and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. And also follow our Instagram page with regard to regular updates as well.